Yo, what's going on, family? I bet y'all are like, where is he now? My backgrounds are forever changing. But I just want to encourage you. Listen, week three of You Gotta Have Faith series, bananas. You don't want to miss this. Go quickly right now. Make sure you subscribe if you hadn't. But go quickly right now and check out this sermon from John chapter 11, Completing Your Faith. Family, I want you to remain standing right there where you are as we, as we, uh, I want to dive right into this text. Y'all already know this is part three, week three of our You Gotta Have Faith series. And um, I feel like, I don't know about y'all, but the first two weeks have been off the chain for me. Uh, yeah, it's been off the chain for me. I'm, I'm, I'm at a point like, oh, how can we go higher, <laughs> you know? So we're we, we going to dive into it. I want you to get your Bibles real quick. Let's go John chapter 11. Very familiar text and scripture for some of you uh, Sunday school uh, cum laude graduates. Uh, you know, some folk graduate top of the class in Sunday school. Others of us slept. But John chapter 11. It should be interesting today, family. I pray that it is. If you got John chapter 11, just shout at me, amen. If you don't, just look at the screen. I mean, it reads like this in John chapter 11. I got verse 20, 21, and 22 for you from the New um, Revised Standard Version, which is the most academically sound translated version of our Bible. And it reads just like this. John chapter 11, verse 20 says, when Martha, y'all know her, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming. Watch this. I want you to hear this. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, this is what she did. She went and met him while Mary, talking about Magdalene, stayed home. Um, Martha, y'all know Martha, said to Jesus, this is when she got there, she said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. I, I really wish I could say it in, in the tone and the sass that I believe that Martha said, but uh, Martha said, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Watch what she says, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Thank God for the reading of the word, the word of God for the people of God. You may have your seats. You can have your seats can have your seats. Family, I want to talk to you using this, this familiar story, and I pray, pray that we can be creative with it, but I want to, I want to speak to you today, Bo, um, from this subject, completing your faith. Completing your faith. Um, as I told you, this is week three, part three of our eight-part faith series, and we're talking today um, from complete faith. Week one was confident faith. Last week was living faith. And today we're going to talk from the thought of complete faith using as a subject completing your faith. Y'all going to ride with me today? All right. It's a little chilly in here. I know it is. Here, here it is, family. Um, when we think about this text, John chapter 11, um, is relatively interesting because it's not hard to figure out who the writer is, right? We know that the writer is John, um, John the evangelist, John the gospel writer. And John writes in chapter 11, and I'm not sure if John is aware of it, but when he writes in chapter 11, he indirectly introduces us to a family of three, a small family of three that live in a small town or a village about the size of Graham called Bethany. Um, so John, I don't know if he really meant to introduce us to them, but he indirectly introduces us to this small family. Um, and what's interesting is I believe that John introduces us to this small family who's Martha, the older sister, Mary, Magdalene, and their brother Lazarus. And I think that John introduces us to this small family in Bethany because he knows that Jesus had a certain connection or that Jesus was familiar with not just the family, but also with Bethany. 
And Jesus was familiar with Bethany family primarily because Bethany was about two miles outside of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was a place that Jesus often traveled to. And when he would travel to Jerusalem, him and his boys, the disciples, they would pause and take a break in Bethany. So Bethany was familiar to him because it was right next to Jerusalem, and that's where he would go and hang out on his way to Jerusalem. And the family is special to him, or they're familiar to him, because it would be at their house that he would park in Paul's on his way to Jerusalem. In fact, Cray, how do you know that? When we look back at Luke's gospel, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, Luke gives us a detailed account of one of the times that Jesus came to the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus and hung out. He says to us, Luke does, he says that when Jesus came to their house, that Martha, she was in the kitchen cooking and handling the chores. But Mary came and sat in the presence of Jesus. Some say that she washed his feet with some expensive perfume and dried his feet with her hair. Others just say she sat in his presence. But either way, when Jesus got there, Luke tells us that Martha was in the kitchen stirring up the food and handling her task. Mary came and sat in the presence of Jesus and Lazarus was in the room watching game two of the Western Conference Finals. So either way, they were doing their thing, and Jesus, um, while he's there, it blessed me, family. And I want to challenge you. I want to give you two terms real quick that are not real deep terms, but they can sound like it, and I use them a lot. One is theology, right? That's the study of God. That's all it is. Theology, the study of God. Christology is the study of Christ. So there's a study of God, theology, and there's a study of Christ, Christology. So I just wanted to give those to you before I continue because I want to challenge you Christologically real quick because there's a reason as to why some people say that Jesus was not just familiar with the family of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, but Jesus had a special connection, Minister Kyle. When he had a unique bond with this family. And there's a couple reasons why people argue this. And I want to break them down to you for the sake of preaching today. One reason is that some people believe, y'all ready for this? That Mary Magdalene was Jesus' girlfriend. See, some of y'all get tight like that, but I'm glad my Savior had a, okay, all right. So some people argue and debate, scholars, that it's a possibility that Mary Magdalene was Jesus' girlfriend. And this, this helps us because it makes sense now why she would go and sit in his presence and Martha would stay in the kitchen. Okay, y'all ain't? All right. So, so, so she, she would sit in the presence of Jesus, but Martha, who asked her to, girl, come in the kitchen and help me. Come fix Jesus a plate. But Mary said, nah, I got to sit in his presence. Um, family, and if it holds true what scholars say that Mary Magdalene was the girlfriend or was in a romantic thing with Jesus, then this also gives us one relationship point that I want to drop on you. And some of y'all right now are like, how in the world are you going to get a relationship point out of Mary Magdalene and out of Jesus? Let me help you real quick. Martha says to her, I'm cooking. Get in here and fix Jesus a plate. Come help me with the chores. But Mary says, no, I'm going to stay in his presence. Here's the one relationship point for some of you sisters. Stop being a wife without the ring. Okay. How, how, how do you get that? Martha wants Mary to come fix Jesus a plate. But Mary says, no, I got to stay in his presence. Let me help you. Some of you are literally and figuratively fixing plates without a ring. When, watch this. When you need to stay in his presence a little longer. Okay, y'all, because it's in his presence that you're going to learn more about him. It's in his presence that you're going to see red flags. It's in his presence that you're going to really get to know him. But too many of us are trying to be wives before you spend time in the presence. So, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me let me go back. Uh, let, let me go back. Uh, but but so, so it's a possibility um, that this is Jesus' girlfriend. But there's another perspective that shouts me, right? Um, some scholars believe that this Mary was also the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Um, and if you remember, when she was caught in the act of adultery, she was brought to Jesus by some deacons and some little boys. And the deacons and little boys said, Jesus, she's naked. She was caught with somebody's husband. Stone her and kill her. But Jesus told them brothers, I was in the line. He said, if you ain't got no sin, then you throw the first stone. So I just rolled mine back to the front and went on about my business. This is what happens. 
Jesus spared her life. So if this be the case, that this Mary, Teresa, is the same woman that was caught in the act of adultery who had been sentenced to death by the deacons and the little boys, but Jesus spared her life by telling them to go away and giving her the probation of don't do it no more. If this is the woman that was in that presence with Jesus, it makes sense to me now and it makes me shout that Martha would stay in the kitchen and cook and she had to be in his presence. You want to know why? Because when your experience with him is different, your response is different. Ah, Mary had her life spared because she know what she did. She should have been dead, but because Jesus spared her life, now I got to stay in his presence and worship him. Martha, you can work. We not knocking you for that. Your experience is different. You got a different relationship. But for about three of us in the room right now that know that Jesus blocked some of the stones that should have took our life, my response is different. So some people come to church and they sit down. They ain't been through what I've been through. I can't sit down on them. I can't be quiet on them because I know all I've been through, my life should have been gone. I should have been stoned to death. I should have lost my absolute mind. But I thank God that my experience is different. And because my experience is different, my response is different. And I'm tired of begging people to come in church and clap their hands and give God praise. Don't worry about it. You ain't got to respond that way. I just know if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, then I would not be right here. So I come in raising my hands. I come in yelling at the praise team. I come in shouting. I come in preaching because my response is different because my experience is different. Yeah, yeah. Kieran, watch this. I can live a whole night in sin. Oh, y'all ain't liking me right there. But because I know my experience with him is different, that despite me, okay, he still spared my life. So even when I'm jacked up and at my worst, I still shout his name. When I'm high, I say his name. When I'm drunk, I say his name. When I get done having sex outside of wedlock, like I still say his name because my experience is different with him. Yeah, so, some of y'all ain't like that. You too churchy. That's your problem. I know what I've been through. I know what he delivered me from. I know what I made it over. I know what I came out of. And when you know what you know and your experience with him is different, your talk is different, your shout is different, your praise is different, your worship is different. My experience. Is different. I know, Jayla, y'all be looking at me when I walk in here straight in here and I'm already yelling at the praise team. I'm already lit. I'm already turned. I'm already pre game I'm already prepared for this. Y'all come in here just now getting started. My motor was already crunk up a long time ago. I was hyped before I got here. I was turned up before I got here. I was ready to preach before I got here because my experience is different. Y'all got to warm up. I'm already going. Jesus, if it holds true that this is the same woman that was caught in the act of adultery, it made sense why she didn't go to the kitchen because I know he blocked the stones, so I got to stay where he's at. Family, Jesus clearly has a special connection to this family. He has a unique bond with this family and one day while Jesus is chilling with the disciples um, in ancient culture I don't know how he got the message but if we can connect it and parallel it to 21st century postmodern culture Martha sends Jesus a text message the blue ones um, she sends him a text message and she lets him know that Lazarus is sick but Jesus responds and tells her in verse 4 of chapter 11, he says, well, this sickness is not unto death, but it's for the glory of God that the Son of God shall be glorified. He gets a text message from her that says Lazarus is sick. Another translation says he responds and says it's not fatal. <sighs> Let me help somebody. He's sick, Jesus. Jesus says... It's not unto death. In other words, he says, for somebody in the room, what has you sick now, it ain't going to kill you. 
I know some of us are sick from heartache. It ain't going to kill you. I know some of us have physical sicknesses going on in our body. Guess what? It ain't going to kill you. I know some of us are sick because how we were raised, what we were raised in, and what we got in front of us. But I'm here to let you know right now what's got you sick today, it ain't going to kill you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He he says, don't worry about it. Um, It ain't going to kill them. This sickness is not unto death. But here it is. Let this help somebody. But what you're going through is just for God to get the glory. So the only reason you even sick, the only reason they broke your heart, the only reason you're broke right now, the only reason your blood pressure is up. I ain't trying to kill you. I just want him to get glory. So so, let let, let me help you. Um, Jesus responds to her. This sickness is not until death. But let me help you all real quick. I'm going to walk slow before I get to the points. Let me help you all real quick, though. Um, Jesus, wait a minute. Now, in seminary, they taught us something bold called tension in the text, right? Which means there's some conflict in the scripture, Taquana. Um, there's some tension here. And the tension is, my sister, is Jesus. Martha sent you a message telling you Lazarus sick. Now, let me help y'all understand this. Martha didn't send the message just to inform him. She sent him with the expectation, Lavanya, that he was going to show up. So there was an unspoken expectation in her message. I'm telling you my brother is sick, so you come and do something about it. But Jesus in verse 4 tells her, no, I ain't coming right now. Okay, y'all missed it. Politely he says, well, this sickness is not fatal, which means from Jesus, I ain't coming right now. How do you know that, Cray? Because in a couple verses over it says he waited a couple days. So she's saying, Jesus, I need you to show up. My brother's sick. Come do something. He says, no, not right now. But verse 5, which comes right after verse 4, when he just told her no, the narrator, the writer John, is intentional about telling us that Jesus loves Martha, Jesus loves Mary, and Jesus loves Lazarus. Wait a minute now. Lazarus is sick. I told you he's sick. With the expectation that you're going to come. You told me politely you ain't coming right now. But then the narrator is going to make sure we know you love all us. So if you really love me, why didn't you come? No, you ain't even got to love me if you love my brother. Why wouldn't you come and see about him? Jesus says, no, not right now. Because sometimes... Love is displayed in a no. Grandmamas and parents, sometimes you love your children by telling them no. Let me help y'all right here. Because a no gives power to your yes. Y'all ain't liking me this morning. Because if you always say yes, it gets watered down. And now their expectation is that you always going to say yes. But when you learn how to sprinkle some no's in there, every now and again, it'll give power to your yes. Because love is sometimes displayed in a no. Young ladies, hear me right now. If he says, if you love me, you will do it. You tell him no, because I love myself. See how love is displayed in a no? Sometimes you got to be confident in your no. For the Bible says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Sometimes you display love by telling them no. See, see, the millennial parents, we got a problem because we want to give our kids everything that we didn't have. So we haven't learned how to tell them no. But sometimes you got to tell them no and teach them how to wash dishes to earn what they're asking for. Okay. Sometimes you got to tell them no and tell them go out there and cut that grass so you'll learn how to earn what you've been asking for. Stop giving them yes every time they ask you something and tell them no, sit down somewhere and don't ask me again. I just had a flashback. That's just how my mama did me. If I said no, don't ask me no more. Jesus says, nah, I'm not coming right now. In fact, the Bible says, the Bible says that, that he waits Two days, he has a discussion with his disciples. They're, they're debating and going back and forth. Jesus, uh, you, you sure? Thomas, who's known at this time, watch this, as the twin. 
not the doubter. Okay, that's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother time. In this text, he's called Didymus, the twin. Other times, he's known as the doubter. Thomas says, Jesus, listen, we love you, man. We already had to fight to get out of there one time. You don't need to go back. And Jesus makes the executive decision. We going back to see about our brother Lazarus. So they pack up. And when they arrive in the area of Bethany, don't miss the text now. The text says Jesus finds out that Lazarus has been in a grave for four days. That means Jesus has missed the funeral. He's missed that little meal with the chicken and the mashed potatoes and green beans after the funeral. Everybody got the same one. He, he's missed, watch this, in their culture, you got seven days to grieve the death of a loved one. He's arrived on the fourth day, which means he's missed half of the grieving process. But Martha, here's what we're about to preach, she hears that Jesus has come into the area and what does she do? And she went to meet him. Family, as we talk about complete faith today, here's point number one. Complete faith starts in your ear and responds in your feet. Help us right here, Cray. Watch what the text says. It says, and when she heard. Watch this. Romans 10 and 17 tells us what? Faith comes by hearing. And when she heard that Jesus was coming, she then moved. Part of it was what she heard was the faith. But the second thing that completes her faith is that she did not just hear, but when she heard, she responded in her feet and she went. Here's the problem that we face. A lot of us hear, but don't do. A lot of us accredit faith to what we hear, so you hear the word, but you don't do the word. That ain't complete faith. A lot of us hear what the scripture has to offer, but don't do anything. That's not complete faith. But your faith is completed not only when you hear, but when you move. She heard that Jesus was coming, and because of what she heard, it caused her to move. Let me help you all right here. That's why we got to be careful what we listen to. Uh, what? If faith comes by hearing, which means I believe what I hear and what I believe makes me act, then that means whatever you hear is what you're going to believe. So let me help you. So this season of my life, as I'm trying to build and increase and connect and complete my faith, you can't be talking reckless around me. If you're not talking about the next level, if you're not talking about the next business opportunity, if you're not talking about salvation and bettering my life, then I don't need to hear your gossip. I don't know. I don't want to want to know what they wore. I don't care where they working at. I don't care where my ex used to be at. I don't care about none of that stuff. If you're not talking into my life, I don't need that because what you hear is what you're going to believe and what you believe is what you're going to do. So if you ain't talking about getting in the bag, okay, you don't need to talk to me in this season. If, if you ain't talking about getting what God has in store for me, then I don't need to hear it in this season because what you hear is what you're going to believe and that's ultimately what your feet going to do. Watch how she moves. This blessed me. She heard that it was Jesus. Y'all not ready for me. I got so much. I got so much inside of me. I can't even get it out. Listen now. Jesus didn't tell her it was him. She heard it from somebody else. Okay. Rewind. Y'all are waiting on God to give you the message when the messenger is standing next to you. Okay. You, 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 you trying to, oh, I'm waiting on God in this season. The Lord going to have to speak to me. But God has sent the messenger and the messenger is in the room and the messenger is trying to tell you not what to do, but the messenger is telling you who's coming. She heard from somebody else that Jesus was coming. And because the messenger in the room, watch this, because she had faith enough to believe the messenger, she went to meet the master. And I can't talk to y'all right now because y'all ain't sound good enough for me. But in this season of my life, I'm listening to the messenger so I can meet the master. Because I know when I connect to the master, whatever I need, he's already told me. He'll supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. So I know if I connect to the master, I'll get what I need. But you got to listen to the messenger. I says, 
what goes in her ear causes her feet to move. The text says when she heard that it was Jesus, then she went and watch what she did. She met him. Can I walk, can I walk this real quick? Uh, she didn't wait on him. Notice this because later in the text it'll tell you he was not in Bethany yet. She just heard he was coming. And when she heard he was coming, she went to meet him. This is what your faith should make you do. Not wait on God to do a miracle, but get there and meet him in the miracle room. I ain't sitting back on a couch looking at a job application, just sitting there blank and saying, I know the Lord going to work a miracle. I know the Lord going to turn it out right now. Nah, I'm writing on it. I'm filling it out. I'm getting somebody to look over. I'm submitting it with my resume. I'm not just sitting here talking about God. I know you're going to get me a husband. I know you're going to get me a wife. Nah, I'm in the bathroom. I'm making sure my hair just right. I'm getting my fade tightened up. I got my beard looking clean. I make sure I put a little shiny stuff on there because you don't know when you're going to meet the one and you got to help God sometimes meet him. You at home talking about you waiting on a husband looking toe up from the floor. Okay. Meet Jesus. Okay, y'all, y'all crazy. I'm just trying to meet him. Do you understand? Je- Jesus. Jesus is coming, and, uh, and, and Martha, watch this. She heard that he was coming, and she went to meet him. Watch what the text says. When she got to him, this was the sister said. She said, I'm ready for this point. She said, if only you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now, I said, let me me, me work this for you. Um, Point number two is this. Complete faith is when faith connects with reasoning. Um, let me sound philosophical right here. Do it. I promise, I promise it ain't that deep, but it's going to sound deep, though. Uh, so, so, so when faith connects to reasoning, what a lot of pastors don't do, Edward, they're not going to talk about reasoning um, and logic in church, right? But I'm going to help you all right here. Reasoning, when defined, is the capacity to consciously justify or prove that something is real. Y'all got it? Reasoning is the capacity to consciously justify, or here's a better term, to make sense of something. (laughs) This this is about to be good to me right here, Bo. Um, Watch this now. Um, So here is what her reasoning is. If you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's her reasoning. How does she mathematically, Melody Walker, put that together? Um, So she takes the fact, number one, that I know that you have done it for other people. And she adds that, Melody Walker, to the fact I know you are powerful. So knowing you've done it for other people, plus you being powerful, multiplied by your love for him equals you can do it. (laughs) Y'all got my equation right there. So... That's her reasoning. She's justified that he can do it because I've seen you do it for them. I know you got power and I know that you love them. So my reasoning is you can do it. And if you would have been here, it would have been done according to my justification through the equation. Told you I was going to sound deep. It ain't that deep, I promise. The equation lets me know that it can be scientifically proven that if you would have been here, he would not have died. That's her reasoning. My reasoning is, God, if you would have gave me better parents, my life wouldn't be like this. My reasoning is, God, if you would have gave me a better spouse, my marriage would have worked out. God, if you wouldn't have allowed me to be raised in poverty, God, I could have made it out. God, if you would have did me like Trump parents and started me off with a million dollars, I would have flipped it and showed you how it worked. My reasoning is if you would have gave me better circumstances, God, I know I'll be in a better place. That's the reasoning. 
The reason is, God, if you never let me get sick in my body, I promise you I can give my very best. The reasoning is, if I would have never got suspended from high school, if I would have never had the opportunity to miss college and go to college, God, my reasoning is, if I would have got the chance that somebody else got, God, I would have showed them how to do it. That's my reasoning. I would have never failed, God, if you had put me in the right situation. If you would have gave me parents that would have motivated and pushed me, God, I would have never failed. That's the reasoning. But for complete faith, you got to connect the reasoning to the faith. The reasoning is, if you would have shown up, he wouldn't have died. The faith is, but even now. Okay, y'all. Okay, what, what, what are you saying towards Martha? Help us right here. The complete faith is that my reasoning is I know if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. My faith says that, but even now. That he's already dead. I know you can ask God for anything and watch this. It's going to happen. So God, I know my reasoning said if you would have put me in better circumstances, my life would have worked out. But even in the jacked up situation I'm in now, I know that if you ask God. And to complete your faith, you got to operate with reasoning, knowing that he could have done it, but also in faith, knowing that he still can. Is there anybody in this room right now that understands the words that are coming out of my mouth that I'm trying to get you to understand that yes, God could have did it 10 years ago, but even as messed up as you are right now, he can do it right now. And I'm so glad that I don't have to look back on my life and complain about the things that did not work out because even at my age now, he can still work those things out. Even now, he can resurrect the dead stuff. Even now, he can help me get to where I'm trying to go. Even now, right now, he still can. Uh, listen. I ain't complaining over how I had a child out of wedlock and you had children out of wedlock and their parents didn't do this and their parents didn't do that. Even now, is any, I, I need five people in this room just to yell, even now. <laughs> the reasoning is I was messed up and God, I would have never did drugs if you would have took the crack pipe out my hand. God, I would have never smoked weed if you would have took the weed out my hand. God, I would have never cheated if you would have stopped me from going over there. But even after all that, even after the crack, even after the weed, even after cheating, even now you can make me upright, you can make me righteous, you can make my life over again, you can turn me around, place my feet on solid ground, you can pick me up. God, even right now, after all that you've been through, after all that you've experienced, after all the failure, even now, Reasoning said I should have made it in college, but I didn't. But God, if you would have made me make it, I would have made it. Reasoning said, God, if you would have put, my, put the pen in my hand and made my hand right on the test, I would have passed it. But Jayla, even after I failed the test, see y'all looking at it natural, I'm thinking spiritually, even after I failed test after test, even after I failed quiz after quiz, essay after essay, God, you're still the one that provides the final grade. And aren't you glad that all you got to do is pass one good test and you'll pass the whole class? And I'm celebrating right now, God, that you could have did it back then. You could have did it at the beginning of the semester. But thank you for the final exam that's going to help me get to where I'm trying to go. I got to move on. I'm complete faith. Number two. Is when you connect your reasoning with your faith. That makes it complete faith. She says, the reasoning is, listen here, Jesus, if you would have been here, I know because I've seen you do it for others. You got power and multiplied by how much you love them equals you could have did it. But since you didn't and you're here now, even now, Whatever you ask God for, it could be done. Just, let, let, let me show y'all something, family. We got to get out of here. I could have closed on that point right there. But uh, I ain't really got the energy to, to jump and stuff like that today. That drive from Birmingham yesterday. I must be getting older or something. But, but I, I, nah, nah, nah. Because when you jump out of your own and not the Holy Ghost, you're going to twist your ankle. You know? <laughs> 
and I'm not about to be out here preaching like this and y'all laughing. No, 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 I'm not jumping on my own. Only God going to make me jump. I'm not twisting my ankle in these air masses up here. Watch this. Let me show y'all something real quick. Go, go ahead and give it to Jason. I, I want y'all to see this. I want to get point number three. Slide one more. Slide. This is a lot of text to read, so I got to come closer because I can't see. But I, I, want y'all to, I want y'all to bear with me right here. Listen to this. This is verse 23. And then you're going to have to go back to the point. You got me. You with me. You ready to roll. You cold. All right. Here it is. We, this impact, we do it exactly how we, okay, y'all got it, how we want to. Jesus said to Martha, your brother, watch this, will rise again. Martha, with her educated biblical self, said to him, I know this. He'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, watch this. I could preach this. I am the resurrection. Huh? And, 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 and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, one who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. See how humble it is, how, how, how God humble you real quick. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she has said this, watch what she does. She went back and she called her sister Mary. Now, I'm going to preach this differently later for the adults than I'm about to preach it now, right? Y'all missed it. When Jesus told her all that, sister, she left and called the one that was worshiping in his presence. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm almost to my point. Watch this. She called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, watch what she did. She got up quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in the spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. In my favorite Bible verse, Jesus wept. Let, 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 let me help you all real quick and I got to go. Here, here, here's the thought right here, family. Let, let me break it down to you what just happened because I had to read it. I want you to get it. Uh, Mary stayed back. Remember that verse? At the house. Now, watch how to flip script. Martha went to Jesus. Mary stayed back to work. Okay, y'all ain't never thought about it like that. First time Martha's working, Mary's in the presence of Jesus. This time Martha goes to the presence and Mary stays back to entertain the guests. Martha has a conversation with Jesus. If you would have been here, my reasoning is my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus has a conversation with her. They talk a little bit about the resurrection. She lets him know, I am the resurrection. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. She says, okay, cool. You got it, Jesus. I'm sorry. Let me go on back to the house and talk to Mary. She gets back. She says, hey, sis, listen. The teacher has shown up. You know the one, um, Christologically, let me wrestle with y'all, the one, um, that you're romantically into, he has shown up. On the flip side of it, the one that spared your life when you should have been stoned, he has shown up. The one that you sat in his presence and worshiped, he has shown up. The one that you knelt down in front of and cried and weeped and dried his feet with your hair, he has shown up. The one that oftentimes comes to visit our house after he's done miracles everywhere else, he has shown up. The one that's on his way to Jerusalem, to the hill of Golgotha, to give up his life for the whole world, that dude has shown up. And Mary says, are you serious? Martha says, yes. And girl, he asked for you. And she jumps up quickly and she heads down to the place where Martha was, where Jesus is. She meets him right there and watch what happens she says the same thing that her sister said but when Martha said it it only engaged conversation but when Mary says it he moves Martha said the same thing which opened conversation 
Mary can't even get her whole statement out before he says, tell me where they laid them. And when he saw her cry and the Jews crying, it said he was disturbed in his spirit and he moved and then he cried. Point number three is this, family. Complete faith comes in twos. Okay, all right. Watch this. I, 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 I got to preach this quick and get out of here green. Um, but here's the reality, family. Sometimes in order to activate faith, you got to team up with somebody that has activated worship. See, let, let me help you. We're not knocking Martha because she had the work ethic. But Mary had the worship ethic. And sometimes you got to take your work and connect to somebody that can worship. And then when y'all come together and complete the faith, Jesus going to move. And maybe Jesus hadn't moved in some of our lives because you've been trying to do it by yourself for too long. But now it's time for you to get a dancing partner, connect with somebody that can worship, connect with somebody that knows how to work, and y'all complete the faith and watch this impact. When you grab my hand and I grab your hand and we go move inside the side, and worshiping and working and worshiping and working. Watch how Jesus moves. Y'all think this place is not packed right now? It's because we hadn't locked in hands yet. But when we lock in our hands together and we get the workers on this side and we get the worshipers on this side, watch how Jesus moves. The place is going to be packed. People's lives are going to be impacted. They're going to be changed. Alcoholics are going to be sober. Crack addicts are going to be healed. People are going to be delivered. Buildings and houses are going to be paid off. Dead is going to resurrect naturally in the life. People with coronavirus, we're going to watch it leave their body. When the worshipers and the workers come together and complete the faith. And is there anybody right now that got faith like I got? That you believe that God still can raise the dead? That God still can heal the sick? That God still can open the eyes of the blind? That God can work out your situation? That God can turn your stuff around? That God can pay off your bills? That God can build up your house? That God can save your child? That God can work? Work it out in your favor when the workers get with the worshipers. We're going to complete the faith. <laughs> Hazelhurst, Georgia. Applin County. Lowndes, Vidalia. Toombs County. Uh, Statesboro. Reesville. Hinesville. Troy, since you're representing all the places that we're connected to in this room right now, some stuff has died. There's dead stuff in all of our cities. I don't even want to talk about the cities. It's dead stuff in our churches. Um, we got dead preaching in our churches. We got dead praise in our churches. We got dead singing in our churches. We got dead faith in our churches. But when the worshipers connect with the workers, when the one that's holding the broom learns how to say hallelujah. When the one that's saying hallelujah learns how to grab the broom. When the worshipers and the workers come together, then we're going to see the completed faith. And when the faith is completed, we're going to see God resurrect dead stuff in our churches. We're going to see God resurrect dead preachers. We're going to see God resurrect dead singers. We're going to see God resurrect dead praisers. When the worshipers and the workers come together, it's going to complete the faith. I'm done, family. I'm done. Complete faith comes in twos. So I'm telling somebody right now that you've been expecting God to do some stuff in your life. You need Jesus to move on behalf of your life. You better find you a worshiper. You better find you a worker. You better find somebody that you can grab their hand. For the Bible says that two are better than one, for they get a greater return on their work. That three cords of a strand is not easily broken. He said, well, two or more come together, touching and agreeing about anything in earth and it shall be released from the heavens. You better find you a dancing partner in this season because I'm trying to dance to my blessing. I'm trying to dance to my healing. I'm I'm trying to dance to the next level. I'm trying to dance to my promotion. You better find you a dancing partner when the worshipers and the workers come together. It's going to complete the faith. Hallelujah. I'm done. Point number three. Listen, family. We, we, we've had it twisted too long, DeWitt. 
we thought faith was based on just us. But you got to connect to somebody to complete this faith. So imagine this. This should shout somebody. If you've been getting what you got on half faith. If you have gotten to where you are on partial faith. If you've accomplished what you accomplished by yourself. Then what's going to happen when you complete your faith? Can you imagine that what you got right now being quadruple because you connected with somebody that's a worshiper or you connected with somebody that's a worker? Husband and wives, one of us got to work and one of us got to worship. One of us got to worship and one of us got to work because that's going to expand our household. That's going to expand our children. That's going to benefit our marriage. That's going to benefit our lives. The worshiper and the worker got to complete the faith. Everyone's standing. I'm done. I'm done. Martha, this is the humbling thing that we don't talk about. Martha, this is what I love about her. She knew what she had to do. She knew, okay, I've engaged in the conversation. I got him talking. Oh, that blessed me. I got him talking. Now, I got to get connected to somebody that's going to get him moving. Listen, the, the, the dangerous thing about a lot of us preachers is that we hear him talking. But it don't stop at him talking. I need a move. Here's the problem in our city right now. One church ain't going to get it done. Because one church can hear him and another church is working with the expectation of him moving but until this city and this region learns how Caucasian pastors Hispanic pastors African American pastors until we learn to bring the worshipers and the workers together they can stop all this line about revival in the city